you take your Bibles, please, and open them to Galatians. And for the sake of acquainting us with this part of Scripture, we will read Galatians 5.25 down through verse 10 of chapter 6. So that hopefully each time we review it, we become more familiar uh, with it. We have heard read already from Mark about our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sung of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today we'll be focusing on some of the commands of Jesus Christ that he gives to us. So please follow as I read Galatians 5.25 and following. If we live in the Spirit... That in the Spirit, let us walk, is the way that actually reads. And let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, not other people. But let every man prove or test or examine his own work, his own life, and then he shall have reason in himself, he shall have rejoicing, excuse me, in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own pack. It's a different word than in verse 2. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit of God, this is a capital S here, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in doing well, or well doing, for in due season, or in due time, we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, let us just kind of work into our text by backing up a little bit in Galatians and kind of gliding, as it were, down to the verses we'll look at this morning. The Spirit, through Paul, has been revealing to us that the Christian life is not managed by an external code only, but it's managed internally by the Spirit of God. There is actually in the believer a new being, a more than a force, a personal being that indwells us, has taken up residence in us, and has become the manager. And though in our lives as believers, there's still the remnants of the flesh and that old nature and that sinful nature, which will not indeed, cannot ever submit to the new master, nevertheless, the Spirit of God is the manager, and little by little he's working to weed out and tear down and root out that flesh that is within us. So how are we to walk in step with our new manager? That's the discussion there at the end of of chapter 5. How are we to walk in step with the Spirit? Because that is the command. Well, he says, we're not to yield at all to the flesh. So, well, what does that look like? Well, that's obvious, he says in chapter 5, verse 19 and following. The works of the flesh are obvious. Someone that is yielding to those can be readily seen. Well, then what does it look like to walk in step with, with the Spirit? What would that look like? Well, let me tell you, he says in verses 22 and 23, this is what it looks like. The Spirit will be producing certain fruit. Fruit like love and joy and peace. And there's a total of nine listed in those two verses. And then he goes on and he says in verse 25, you know, you've crucified the flesh. If you're a believer, you have crucified the flesh. And you now have life from the Spirit. That's verse 25. So let me repeat again, he says. Keep in step with this new manager. 
Don't give in to the flesh. That's the focus of verse 26. And now he says, here's what it means to bear the Spirit's fruit in the context of the Christian community. And we looked at three imperatives that we found in the first five verses. On the one hand, it means that as you go about bearing the Spirit's fruit, you should be extending yourself as, as a body to those who have fallen and need to be lifted back up. That's verses one, verse 1. And as you yourself seek to bear fruit, you need to, verse 2 of chapter 6, be helping to bear the burdens of others. This is not every man for himself in the Christian race. Part of bearing the Spirit's fruit in the Christian community is actually reaching out, though we may be weak ourselves, and helping other people bear their burdens. The Christian life is weak people helping weak people. And then he says, as you seek to bear fruit, you should, verse 4, examine your own work. You should rejoice in your own progress and not in your comparison with others. Those are three commands there. Verse 1, to restore. Verse 2, to bear. Verse 4, to examine. And then verses 6 and 7, we have two more commands. Verse 6 is a command to share. That's in the imperative form. And verse 7 is a warning against being deceived. Don't be deceived is actually there in the command form. Those are our verses for today. Verse 6, if you look at it, actually begins with a conjunction. A conjunction and. In fact, if you have a King James, it's not in there. And I would suggest you add that because that's in the Greek text. And it would read this way. And let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, as we will see in a moment, that relates it back to the previous discussion. So what we have here in verse 4 then, or verse 6, excuse me, is our fourth imperative of the, of the chapter. Let him communicate. Let him communicate. Well, it's a present It's an active imperative or command, which means it's to be an ongoing habit, not just an occasional activity. And the verb is koinoneo, from which we get our, our word fellowship also in the Bible. It means to share with someone or to exercise fellowship. And Paul uses this verb five times. And I want us to look at four of them. I want, you to, I want to take us through the first four occurrences of the, of the usage of this word translated here in the King James to, to communicate. And I'm doing this because instead of just saying, you know, this is what this word means. I want us together to see how Paul uses it. Because we understand the meaning of a word by its usage. How is it used? And that's why sometimes the older generation don't understand the words of the younger generation because they might use familiar words, but they use them with different meanings. Well, in the Bible, we need to understand the usage of a word or the meaning of a word by its usage. So let's go first to Romans chapter 12. In fact, if you want, you can make a little chain reference in your Bible by putting the next reference right over the word and the previous reference. In Romans 12, if you're familiar with this chapter, and you probably are with the opening verses at least, uh, you'll know that this is really a chapter full of short, staccato-like commands. It's the application section of Romans. And he's giving all these different commands to the people of God. And in Romans chapter 12, uh, in verse 13, he says, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. The New American... New American Standard would say this, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. The word is distributing or contributing. And the command here is clearly to share one's material substance with needs and sa- with, with saints in need, excuse me. Contributing or distributing to the necessity of the saints. Now right above that word distributing, you might want to put Romans fifteen and verse twenty seven. And then let's go there together. Romans 15, 27. And the context in Romans 15 is actually a collection of money that's being gathered by the churches 
in Achaia and in Macedonia and being sent to the churches of Jerusalem who found themselves because of a drought and because of a famine in, in severe need. Let me begin reading in verse 26 of Romans 15. Paul says, It's pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles, he's speaking of those Gentile believers now in Macedonia, Achaia, have been made partakers, and that's our word right there, partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal, or we would say, material things. Now, our word here in this verse is actually speaking of a spiritual sharing. They've been made partakers of their spiritual things. But notice in this verse the principle that Paul points to to justify this collection for Jerusalem. He's saying it's not just a matter of Christian kindness on the one hand and Christian need on the other hand. He says there's a principle involved which makes this, he says, a duty which makes these believers actually indebted to minister And the principle is this. The Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. So in return, their duty is to minister back material things. That's the principle. It's unusual as that might sound to us. That if someone receives spiritual things, the duty, he says, they're indebted to return material things. Now, above that word, you might want to put our text, Galatians 6, 6, because that's the next reference, and we'll go there quickly. We still have a bookmark in that page. Galatians 6, 6 says, Let him that is taught the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And the fourth reference is Philippians 4, 15. And I'd like us all to go there and look at that. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now, Paul's writing from prison. He's writing from Rome many, many years um, after having founded this church. And, And he's referring back now to something that happened way back just after he founded the church. It happened actually many years previously. And he says in Philippians 4.15, now you Philippians know this. He says this is part of their church history. You're aware of this. But I just want to bring it up again to you. Uh, that in the beginning of the gospel, that means, he means, you know, the beginning of the gospel having reached you and going out into Europe and Macedonia, the beginning of this whole endeavor to spread the gospel. When I departed from Macedonia, that's where Philippi is, no church communicated with, and there's our verb again, no church communicated with me. Well, what's he talking about? Well, as concerning giving, and receiving, but you only. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again, that means at least how many times? Twice, right? Once and again. Unto my necessity. What Paul is saying, after he, if you know Acts, the story of Acts, you know that after he left Philippi, he, the very next place he went was Thessalonica, about a three days journey. And we know that he wasn't there very long. Perhaps he was there only three weeks in Thessalonica. And yet during that short time, at least once and again, the church in Philippi sent, communicated with Paul and sent him gifts for his material necessities. Now the fifth time Paul uses this word is in the pastoral epistles, where it has to do with sharing in someone's sin. So it's a different context altogether. But, but let me just point, let me just pause here and say that when a preacher has to preach on um, the duty, which is the word used in Romans, of the congregation or those who are taught, to use the expression in Galatians, To share all good things with the one who teaches, uh, that, that puts the preacher in an awkward position. In fact, I've never had to preach on this topic at all in my life before. 
And it's awkward because of this, because, because on, the, on the surface, it, it immediately appears what? It, it immediately appears to be self-serving. In fact, it's awkward for Paul. And that's why he, after he says in verse 14 there in, in Philippians 4, that you did the right thing in helping me in my financial affliction, he says in verse 17, look at verse 17, he says, not, I'm not saying this because I desire a gift. See what he's clarifying? I'm not patting you on the back just to get another love offering. Okay? I'm not motivated by a desire for a bigger paycheck. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account, which is a very interesting expression in the light of Galatians 6-7, which says that don't be deceived, God is not mocked for whatever man sows, that will he also reap fruit. He'll reap fruit. So as we go back to Galatians, and I want to return there to chapter 6 now, I just want to say this. It's not because I desire a gift. Really. In fact, just about everyone here can testify to the fact that the reason I'm preaching on this text on this Sunday is because it happens to be the next text that has to be preached on. And we've been working through Galatians for more than a year now. My motives are not self-seeking. And if anything, I'm thinking of head to the next pastor God will bring and challenging you for his sake. But, but it's also my desire that we do what we do, not just out of habit and not just out of tradition, but based on biblical teaching. Now, Galatians 6, verse 6 says this, And let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. It's a command. It's a command to share. And immediately we're, we're wondering, why did Paul say this? This seems so abrupt. In fact, all the commentators will say this seems so abrupt here to put this in at this point. And we don't want to force and imagine too much about the situation in Galatia. But one thing we do know is that when Paul founded those churches in Galatia, he came back through and the Bible says that he appointed elders in every city. He appointed elders in every church. And so here were these men appointed by Paul to be the elders, and probably out of these men came a teacher in every church, one who was primarily responsible for teaching the Word of God to the people. But then these false teachers came in, and they were teaching another gospel, and it's very possible, and obviously this is just guesswork, but it's very possible that the people, as they began to turn to the new teachers and to this new doctrine, they actually abandoned their responsibility to their own teachers. And so here Paul is challenging them not to follow these men and he brings up this very appropriate point that part of bearing each other's burden is, remembered, is remembering the financial burden of your teachers. And so what we have in verse 6 is the command to share. That will be our first main point. And in verse 7 we have a warning against deception. So let's consider that command to share. Let's take it apart there in verse 6. The and there at the beginning of the verse connects it back to the discussion that has already taken place. Verse 2 says, it says, bear one another's burdens. Now, everyone's responsible for this, he says. Everyone has to bear his own pact. Everyone has to take part in bearing each other's burdens. And, he says, let him that is taught, and he goes on. In other words, verse 6 seems to be one specific application of bearing one another's burdens. One aspect of mutual burden bearing is the care for the teacher and his burdens. So let's consider then, under this heading, the command to share, let's consider, first of all, whose burden are we to bear? Let's ask that question. Or we could put it this way, with whom are we to share? Because that's the verb, to share, to communicate. And if you look in your Bible, it says that we're to share, we're to communicate, we're to bear the burden of him that teacheth. And that refers immediately, we see this, it refers immediately, chiefly to oral instruction. Someone who is giving the oral instruction to the congregation. And you'll notice that the content of his teaching is there in verse 6, the Word. That's right there in the middle of the verse. 
So if we accept this as God breathed, that's coming from the Holy Spirit, then it immediately calls our attention to several very significant implications about the church. And I'd just like to point out now, as a sub-sub point, here's several implications that this leads us to. The first one is that Christ not only provided his church with a holy Bible, but with teachers who are supposed to teach the Bible. It's assumed there that the people taught will have a teacher. And these teachers have part of the burden to bear. These teachers have to teach the people. That should be the preachers, that should be the pastors' primary, primary focus is on teaching. That's why it refers to them as the teacher. On preaching the word of God to the people. Now, is it true that Christ has given to his church today not only the Bible, which we have, but he's also designed and desired and given to the church teachers to teach the Bible? It's exactly what Ephesians chapter 4 says. When it says this in verse 11, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. I would think of that as the same office or person, pastor, teacher. And he did this. Christ gave this to the church for the equipping of the saints, so that the saints in the pews can be equipped unto the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. The saints have to work to build up the body, but to equip them, Christ has given to his church pastors and teachers. So Paul's exhortation indicates that the teacher here had a fixed status. And that teaching was to be a primary ministry in the church. Second implication is that the ministry of teaching is to be among the most prized possessions of the church. Of all the ministries in the church, among the most prized should be the ministry of teaching. Remember, he's speaking about bearing each other's burdens in the church. And now he wants to make specific application. And he doesn't say, he's, he's, you know, now make sure that the teen activity coordinator uh, gets taken care of. Or, or make sure that the senior citizens for fitness and health trainer, you know, get, gets taken care of. Because we want that ministry in the church. No, he says the teacher. The one teaching, actually. And, and please understand this, okay? This is not an exalting of any individual. What this actually is, is an exalting of a ministry in the church. Just like you might say to your children, we respect firefighters. And it's not because you are just in awe of all these men that are firefighters and that they are somehow inherently worthy of respect. It's because you appreciate the fact that there are men prepared and ready to fight fires, right? And for their work's sake, you you appreciate them, just like a policeman. It's not that he's inherently worthy of respect, but his office is. And so it is here. It's not that he doesn't say, you know... Epaphroditus or some other individual. No, that's not the, the, the focus is not on any individual. What he's exalting is the ministry of teaching within the church. And I could just say here that it should be a danger sign, really, when any preacher is lifted up as a personality and given special status as a being. It's hard to express, but you know what it's like when you see it. I remember as a young man going to hear a preacher preach. There were probably upwards of 5,000 people in attendance. And when the man stepped up to the platform, he hadn't said a word, he hadn't preached, he hadn't spoken. The whole congregation of thousands rose to their feet and applauded. They gave him a standing ovation. And as I remember this as a child, it just seemed to go on and on and on. And the man just stood there like this. That should be a warning sign. And as it proved in the ministry of this man, it should have been taken a warning sign for him. No, the man is not exalted 
But the activity of ministry is prized by the church. Now, the Bible does say in Philippians 2.29, Receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. It's talking about Epaphroditus in that case. Hold men like him in high regard. The art of hold people in high regard for their work's sake, but not inherently as individuals. So this implies here, the specific application to burden bearing implies that the ministry of teaching is among the most prized possession of the church. And the third implication from the fact that we are to help bear the burden of the teacher is not only that Christ has provided not only the Bible but, but teachers, and not only that we prize this ministry within the church, but thirdly it implies that the ministry of teaching is to be an engrossing affair. The context is burden bearing. And the implication is that the teacher is so engrossed in his ministry of teaching that it has created a financial burden on him and his family that others within the body are to help bear. In other words, the teaching ministry is so time-consuming that it leaves him with financial burdens. He actually has to put aside some other duties. Ronald Fung says this, quote, Even if the teacher was not a full-time instructor in the faith, his work of teaching and preparation for teaching must have taken enough of his time that the community had to be responsible for his material support. Here we have probably then the earliest extent of evidence for a form of full-time or nearly full-time ministry supported by the congregation in the early church. End of quote. Now, a few things that I'm not saying. I'm not saying that a preacher must be full-time or should always be full-time. I'm saying that the ministry of teaching is an engrossing affair. And, and it should be provided for by the church. I'm not saying this, that teaching cannot be provided as a gift. It was by Paul. It is by missionaries all over the globe to the people to whom they minister. Nor am I saying that a minister should devote his energies only to one congregation exclusively. Paul certainly didn't do this. In fact, nearly all the reformers uh, were seminary professors as well. And, and far from being a hindrance to their preaching, the time they spent in the Word and teaching the Word actually grew their influence in the church. I'm saying that the ministry of teaching is to be an engrossing affair. When God calls a man to this, it is to take up his time and his energies and sometimes his nights of sleep. And so we asked, whose burden are we to bear? Or with whom are we to share? And we answered, the one gifted and called by God to teach. The second question is this, who is to help bear his burden? Or, or who is to share? And if you look at verse 6 again, it says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate. So the one who is to share, the one who is to help bear the burden, is the one who is being what? Taught the word of God. This is the word catechumen. We get our word cate catechism from it. Or a catechist. A, a catechumen is a child that's in catechism. The ones being catechist. Oh, I can't say it. I'll just skip it. The ones being taught. And uh, the command here is in the singular. Okay? So it's, it's individualized to every individual who receives the ministry of teaching. In other words, this isn't just the ministry of the, the duty of the church as a whole, but it's actually the duty of each person as an individual to see and make sure that the teacher's financial burdens are borne up. So this command then is addressed to every individual being taught the word. I used to work for a dear sweet old lady at um, in college. I was actually I was before college uh, after I just graduated from high school, and she would chide students for going week after week to a church in town 
and never putting any money in the offering plate. And she says, you know, you, you put money into the snack machine, you put money into the Coke machine, you're willing to put down money for a little snack or a little drink, and yet you're not even willing to put down one dollar a week to go into a building that's air-conditioned, that has the lights on, and water running, and a sermon prepared, and people to love you, and you won't even, you won't even put one dollar a week down for that. She had a point. And really, this, this broaden, we should broaden the focus beyond just the actual teacher to the setting in which we're taught. It takes money for us to keep up the setting which we have preserved here for the teaching of the Word of God. So who is to bear the burden? Well, each individual that is being taught. And the third question we want to ask then is, what part of the burden are we to bear? Or what are we to share? And we've already alluded to it, but look exactly what the Bible says. It says in verse 6, Let him who is taught the word communicate unto him that teaches the word. And then it says this, In all good things. An expression that is used throughout Scripture to refer to material blessings. In fact, the rich man who is going to build bigger barns to store his good things. And it's this expression. So, we are to share in all good things. That word in is important because there's no totality involved here. He's not saying that you have to share all the good things that he has. The idea is just as the King James translates it, in all good things. One translation is a little loose, but I think it gives the meaning well when it says this. When anyone who is under instruction in the faith... When anyone is under instruction in the faith, he should give his teacher a share of all good things he has. So the sense is undoubtedly physical things that God has blessed him with. He is to share in all things materially. And what seems to be suggested here is that what is communicated or what is shared with the one teaching is, is to be in proportion to the material blessings enjoyed by the one who is taught. So, so if a congregation is poor, then they're going to share in, in all the good things that they have, which would probably be very limited. If a congregation is not in a third world country, and so is relatively rich, which every congregation in the States is relatively rich, they are to share in all good things that, that they have. So the sharing in all good things that is enjoyed by the people, by the congregation. And what this does is it rules out for us two equally wrong extremes. And one is that surfaced in the Middle Ages and has surfaced again today is the reimbursing of the pastor at a rate that far exceeds the average congregant. In the Middle Ages, the wealthiest people on earth were not even the kings. They were the bishops, the cardinals, and the popes. These people received an exorbitant amount of money. They fleeced, really, the sheep. And today this is happening again in many large churches and many of the megachurch movements where the salaries that some of these men are receiving is, is almost to be compared with some of these medieval bishops. And cardinals, an exorbitant amount of money. That's not what he's calling for here. And of course, the other extreme would be reimbursing the pastor at a rate that falls far below the average congregant. Like you might have heard the prayer of the deacons. Lord, you keep the preacher humble and we'll keep him poor. Now, both of these are ruled out. There's no, the point is that there's no fixed amount. But it should be in proportion to all the good things enjoyed by the congregation. And so a church in Mexico City and a church in Manhattan will probably have to come at this totally differently because of the needs of the pastor and the good things enjoyed by the congregation in each case. Now, how does this fit into the whole concept of bearing one another's burdens? Well, what we have here is, is this mutual sharing. The congregation has a need to be instructed 
by the teacher. It's met by the teacher. And the teacher has a need resulting from that that needs to be met by the congregation. There's this interdependence that is created by God. The congregation cannot thrive in its ministry without the teacher. Remember Ephesians 4, that Christ gave some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry? A church cannot thrive in their ministry without the God-given work of a, of a preaching minister. The church needs a pastor teacher to thrive in its God-given ministry of building each other up and reaching the lost. And yet, the teacher cannot thrive in his ministry unless the congregation comes to his need. You see this mutual then interdependence that is created. There's a mutual dependence between the two. God has designed the congregation to be dependent on the ministry of the pastor teacher. And so God wants the congregation to be appreciative and grateful for God's provision of a man. And yet God has also designed for the pastor teacher to be dependent on the congregation at least to some degree. For his daily bread. And God wants the pastor teacher to be appreciative and grateful for the role of the congregation in his life. And this is what makes him get up in the morning. This is what serves to spur him on the realization that other people are sacrificing so that he can have the luxury of time that he has to spend in God's Word. So he better be reading. He better be studying. That's his share of the burden. He better have something to feed the flock of God with. Now, is this corroborated by other Scripture? And I'm taking the time with this because... There probably will not be another message like this for years to come. And appropriately so. But, but as a congregation, we are responsible not to be half-hearted about this. We actually need to develop a conscious theology of pastoral remuneration. And we need to know what the Bible corroborates, what the Bible teaches. Some people look at providing for the preacher as some special privilege. And from his perspective, it is a privilege. It's undeserved. But from the perspective of the congregation, it's a responsibility. It's a duty. It's a debt. And I'd like us to go to 1 Corinthians 9. There's several passages that this comes up in. I'd just like us to read through... Uh, the first 15 verses, and I'll just make a few comments. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1, Paul is arguing for his rights. He says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? That's a reference to his uh, apostolic authenticity there. And are not ye my work in the Lord? Verse 2, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Now, what Paul's going to go to at the end of the chapter is that he's not only going to forego his rights as a Christian, he's going to forego his rights as an apostle. But through verse 14, he's actually pointing out the rights of a minister of the gospel. He says this, verse 3, Mine answer to them that examine me is this, Have we not power, and you need to think of it as the word right, have we not the right or the authority to eat and drink? And, and the, the implication is here at the church's expense. The right of maintenance by the church. And that will become clear in the following verses. Um, he's not saying he goes without eating or drinking. He's saying, well, I have the right. Don't we have the right to eat and drink at the church's expense? Verse 5. Have we not the right to lead about a sister, a wife, that is a believing wife? Once again, at the church's expense, just like other apostles do, just like, for example, uh, Cephas or Peter. I mean, this was a right that Peter exercised, and he's not reproached in any way for doing so. I mean, why should he be? It's his right. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 6, or is it I only and Barnabas that have not the right to forbear, that is to refrain from working? Do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working when everybody else has that right? Now notice how he argues for this, verse 7. 
He says, look, who, who goes to warfare at any time on his own charges? I mean, what soldier in the Marine is going to Iraq raise his money to go to Iraq on his own charges? Or who plants a vineyard and does not eat of the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock and does not eat of the milk of the flock? So I say I these things as a man? Is that, in other words, is this just my human reasoning? Or does not the law say the same also? This is corroborated by the law of God. For it is written, verse 9, in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So while the ox was treading the corn, he had a right to eat some of it. And does God take care of oxen? In other words, was God only thinking about oxen when he wrote that? Paul says, no, he had a bigger thought in mind. Verse 10, or said he altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt it is written. So that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now listen, look at verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal, that is, material things? I mean, right there is the biblical principle. And it's going to be stated even more clearly in just a few verses. But if we reap spiritual things, we have a right to reap material things from you. Look at verse 12. If others be partaker of this right over you, don't we have the right, he's saying? Nevertheless, we've not used this right. But we suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 13. Here's another illustration from Old Testament law. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things of Excuse me. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Referring to priests. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? He's saying, go all the way back to Aaron, and you'll see that it was designed so that the priests would actually live off a portion of the sacrifices that people brought to the Lord. They brought their sacrifices, a portion of it went to the priest and his family. Does that carry into the New Testament church? I mean, that's a huge question. And the answer is yes, because he says in verse 14, even so. Just as with the Old Testament priests, even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That is, they should get their living from the gospel preaching. That's God's ordaining. Okay, so we, we shouldn't be afraid of this. Even to teach it or to believe it, this is God's ordination here. And those were Paul's rights. But he says in verse 15, I've used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should, not, that it should be done so unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. And he goes on, but we know that Paul did receive gifts from, for example, the Philippians. Um, so it wasn't all the time that he refused gifts, but he did so in the Corinthian church. Well, someone might object and they might say, well, even though it's a right, shouldn't all preachers follow Paul's example instead of Peter's? Well, I would answer maybe some should. But remember that Paul, and he alludes to it here, Paul also gave up his right to be married. And so maybe some preachers should give up that right. But I would not take the position that it's necessary or even beneficial for all ministers to remain unmarried and to receive no pay. So let's not create a standard here that is higher than the Bible with regard to the preacher's marital status or financial remuneration. Paul did receive gifts, and his emphasis is constantly that you should do this, but I, for reasons of my own, have not chosen to exercise this right. And I think, really, if we want to apply this to modern day, I think Paul's situation is somewhat analogous to that of a missionary. A missionary is going into an area where they do not know the gospel, and... And so, not only for practical, out of practical necessity, but also for matters of spiritual testimony, he may at times refuse to receive material gifts from the people to whom he's ministering. 
it, it is probably a matter of testimony. He doesn't want these people to, be, to say, oh, this man's just coming to fleece us and to get our money. So he's not going to come in the first day and say, let me tell you about what God has ordained for the church. You understand the reasons of testimony. And so actually there are other churches, churches like Philippi, that will actually contribute to the support of this man so that he doesn't have to take any money from those people. But I would say that the problem in missions is that, um, that the, many times the people have not been taught their responsibility to care for their pastor. And so when the pat missionary pastor does leave and the national pastor comes in, the people simply don't know how to take care of him. In fact, I know two churches in France. I know one where they got rid of their, their missionary pastor, finally left. He stayed two years. They got rid of him and they said, we want a missionary back. It's too much work to have to pay for a pastor. And I know another church where the pastor, now a Frenchman, is having to work another job and because his church was never taught by the missionary their responsibility to pay for him. So the command in verse 6 is a command to share. Well, let's go back to Galatians chapter 6 and look at verse 7. And our second and final main point is that second imperative there that's found in verse 7 which is a warning against deception. And this is very interesting the way it falls in this context. Bear each other's burdens. Help bear the financial burdens of your teacher. And verse 7, don't be deceived about this whole thing because God will not be mocked. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. This is a warning against deception. Now there's a... There's a debate whether verse 7 belongs exclusively to verse 8 or exclusively to verse 6. I think it's a bridge, really, between the two. From the narrow context of verse 6 to the large principle that he's going to expound on in verse 8. And so the application can go both ways, back on verse 6 or forward to verse 8. He says, just to back up to verse 6, Let him that is taught the word communicate to him that teacheth all, in all good things. And don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. And what's he saying here? Well, we understand that money is a big part of our lives, right? And that more than anything else, it, it reveals our priorities. And he's just talked about bearing the Spirit's fruit. I try to try to grasp this. I'm trying to explain this in the best possible way I can. But, but part of bearing each other's bearing the spirit's fruit is bearing each other's burdens. Part of bearing each other's burdens is sharing materially with your teacher. Now he says, do you want to bear the spirit's fruit? Then be careful what kind of seeds you sow. If you want to bear the spirit's fruit, you better sow to the spirit because whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. In other words, you can sow all your seeds in the bigger barns, in the big plasma TVs, in the trips with Disneyland. You can sow all your seeds into that which yields comfort or satisfaction merely to the fleshly part of your nature. But don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. That will he also reap. It's in the context of how, where you put your money. Or... You can throw your seeds into restoring the fallen, bearing other believers' burdens, which includes as a subset caring for the needs of your pastor teacher. And if you sow your seeds into those responsibilities, you will reap what you have sown. In other words, try to get this. The contrast is not between big and little crops, but between different kinds, kinds of crops. It's not at all this. Put, it, put a little bit of uh, money in the offering plate and God will give you a little bit of money back. Put a whole lot of money in the offering plate and you'll get a whole bunch of money back from God. That's actually how it's taught. That this is a matter of big and little crops. It's not that at all. It's a matter of different kinds of crops. The spirit's crop or the flesh's crop. This is not seed faith theology. You ever get those things in the mail? Send your seed faith offering. You know, in this prepaid envelope. It's saying this, that God has given you good things. And you can choose what kind of crop you want to grow with those good things God has given you. God has entrusted money to you. And you can choose what kind of crop you want to do with that money. You want to grow with that money. 
You can put all your money into your retirement, comfort, prestige. But don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. That will he also reap. I mean, who cares if you have a nice retirement or a plush and comfortable home? If you sow to the flesh, if you sow, put all your eggs in that one basket of the flesh, you'll reap destruction. So what good is a rich retirement with a destroyed family? Tell me that. Or you could put your money into that which will grow the Spirit's fruit, into the ministry of the church, of lifting up the fallen, of bearing other saints' burdens, of contributing to the ministry of teaching in the church. <clears throat> and if you sow to that which promotes the Spirit's fruit, you will reap a harvest. Well, let me just real quick on an application to the children here whose parents send you to Christian schools. I want to talk to you specifically. You don't understand the magnitude of your parents' sacrifice. If they could take all that money and put it into savings accounts, into IRAs, they would be far ahead of where they are today. But let me tell you why they're doing it. They would rather put their money into that which would profit you spiritually than into that which would please their flesh. They are sowing not to their flesh, but to the good of your spirit. Now, please understand, I'm not saying Christian school or home school is an absolute. There, there are many factors that go into such a decision. I am saying, I'm explaining the motivation behind those that do make their, the sacrifice. And it's noble. And the children should honor it and respect it and be grateful for it. And it's like that in all areas of life. Not just the teacher, not just the church, but in all areas of life. God has given us many good things. Now, what are we going to do with that money? Are we going to put it solely towards that which pampers the flesh? Or are we going to put it towards that which encourages the work and fruit of the Spirit? And it's not that this happens somehow magically. It's not that... It's not seed faith at all. It's just, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's that the Spirit makes it happen. He sees you do that, and He makes His fruit to grow. And you know, I would guess, this is a strong statement, but I would guess that we could go to family after family after family, and their spiritual prosperity or their spiritual destruction would actually correlate with their checkbook. I bet you we could go to what they spend money on. And it would correlate with the prosperity of the family, spiritually or not. That's the principle here. You sow to your flesh, you're going to reap destruction in your family and in your own life. I would challenge you to prove me wrong. Maybe there's a fear in us that says, well, yes, but if I change my priorities... And if I put my money into that which will bring spiritual prosperity to me as an individual, to my children, to the, to the needs of the Gentiles in other lands, then how, how will I eat? And you know what Paul said after he commanded the Philippians, commended the Philippians for making such a generous donation to the progress of the gospel through the work of Paul? He said, you made this generous gift. And then he said this, Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That promise comes to the church that had sacrificially given to the ministry of the Gospel. A ministry that for the Philippians, actually they weren't reaping the immediate benefits. It was the Corinthians that were reaping the benefits and the Thessalonians that were reaping the benefits. But to them came this promise, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And what you discover is that the man who hoards and who hoards and who hoards because he's always worried about provision. is no better off than the man who gives and who gives and who gives. Because with that second man, God is looking after him. 
Would you rather you looked after your own checkbook or God looked after your checkbook? The challenge for us, all of us, is to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. It's to question even where we put our material substance. What kind of fruit are we trying to grow with the expenditure of our money? Because don't be deceived. God is not mocked in this. You can't somehow trick God. What you sow, you will also reap. To remind us of God's faithfulness and God's provision, I'd like you to take your bulletin and turn to the back page. We're going to sing this song written by John Newton based on Philippians 4.19. I hope that we'll see the matter of provision is not merely a matter of IRAs and savings accounts and things like that. It's a matter of God's provision. And that we have the promise that He will indeed provide. So shall we stand please together at the back of our bulletins and sing the Lord... The Lord will provide.